Today, tens of thousands of people flock to attend spectacles such as the annual Warbirds over Wanaka to see classic aircraft in action. But these preserved and restored stars of today's air shows were once everyday workhorses performing vital roles in New Zealand's civil and military aviation. For the next 90 minutes, we're going to revisit those classic years. Although New Zealanders were quick to take to aviation as a hobby pursuit, as depicted in this 1913 footage, the first regularly scheduled passenger service in New Zealand didn't begin until 1934, and it was only after the end of World War II when commercial aviation really became established as a means of travel. The following publicity film made in 1948 for the National Airways Corporation officially launched on the 1st of April 1947 extolled the virtues of seeing the country from 5,000 feet up. In it you'll see examples of the ubiquitous Douglas DC-3, the Lockheed Lodestar and Electra 10A and the de Havilland Dominie. Wings that tell the time by seconds from day to day. Wings that carry a nation's advancing commerce towards prosperity. This is the story of those wings. Before 1939 and during the war years, there was several air services pioneering the framework on which the many routes now linking the Dominion centres and rural areas were built. Such was the post-war demand for air travel, it was soon apparent that the only manner in which the highest degree of efficiency could be reached and maintained was to assemble the knowledge and experience of all the companies into one comprehensive organisation. Under the New Zealand National Airways Act of 1945, these companies were amalgamated into the National Airways Corporation, serving city and outback, businessmen and travellers. The wings of war air transport services were added to strengthen the routes, which were to stretch the length and breadth of the land and out into the vastness of the Pacific. small beginnings, the new corporation achieved the complete overall coverage of New Zealand's air route. NAC airports dotted the Dominion from Kaisaia to Invercargill, serving not only the four main centres, but 21 other towns. NAC had 13 aircraft in 1946. Two years later, there were 40. These were the mileage figures for the last 12 months of private operation. In their first financial year, NAC more than doubled them. Passengers increased by 84%. Men and women in a hurry. Men and women with faith in air travel. NAC was fulfilling every promise its planners had made for it. But to NAC executives, the figures spoke far more than convenient public statistics. They represented the successful administration of a planned program of operations. Every person who served a cup of tea worked out flight plans, translated weather reports, tightened the nut, inspected the propeller shaft, weighed baggage, opened aircraft doors, and fueled wing tanks. They'd all served NAC well, and through them, NAC had served New Zealand. In this last year, many famous overseas personalities visiting New Zealand have travelled NAC. Anthony Eden, Sir Peter Buck, Sir Lawrence Olivier, Vivian Lee. And here's Cicely Cotnett herself. NAC provides one of the most comprehensive air services in the world. Above all, it's a service without fatigue. Let's follow an intending passenger who's going to fly from Auckland to... Uh, where is it? Thank you. 
in the cargo. He's going south to the Empire's nearest city for the coast. Looks like a wonderful holiday away from home with no home worries. But a real holiday should have no worries of any sort. This passenger has two children to cope with. But there'll be no complications. NAC is very understanding of problems like this. The baggage miraculously disappears and does not again concern the passenger until the arrival at her destination. And from the very beginning, the fear of travelling with its 101 minor difficulties and problems ceases entirely. At every major airport in the Dominion, a hostess cares for passengers, helping them to obtain refreshments and information before plane calls. She assists mothers with their children and ensures an easy implaining for every one of her charges. The baggage that disappeared at the terminal is loaded by the ground staff before the passengers go aboard. And then the aircraft is ready for the takeoff. <laughs> From Penuakai, Auckland's main airport, our passengers fly over the city of Auckland, bustling into two great harbours and fronting an ocean and a sea. the aircraft, the service extends still further. Magazines, refreshments and continuous attention provided en route are popular features of air travel. Special children's picture books are also provided. But it's the scenery outside that makes flying in New Zealand one of the most exhilarating experiences imaginable. Southwards over land cut deep by powerful rivers and wide harbours. Majestic panoramas of cloud and snowscape. And ocean views along a coastline which bounds Britain's furthest dominion. Over Cook Strait named for the great Yorkshire navigator James Cook. Towards the South Island, with its wheat and fruit and woolen mills, its English and Scottish craftsmanship, and its calm industrious efficiency. Down the east coast, past the piercing seaward Kaikoura Mountains. And then into the patchwork quilt of the Canterbury Plain. Christchurch, a quiet cathedral and university city, nestles close to the Kashmir Hills, sprawls over the Avon River, and tumbles on into the plains which bring it its wealth. For some of the passengers, the journey is already over, and they are pissed away to the city by fast motor buses. Our travellers, however, still have two more legs of their journey to cover, then Eden, and then in the cargo southernmost terminal of NAC's network. But their wait at Harewood Airport is a pleasant one. Christchurch, the garden city, thrusts her charms even as far as the airport. Bed after bed of flowers frame the more mundane but necessary hangars and administration blocks of a busy transport centre. <laughs> The change of aircraft is waiting to continue the journey. The 
further southwards, past nestling market gardens, rich wheat land, and coastal sheep and cattle farms, along the great Canterbury Bight, towards the Edinburgh of the Southern Ocean, Dunedin, the city of Granite, spiritual home of every stop south of the line. Famous for its progress in medical science, for the oats which make the Dominion's breakfast, the sterling of the pipes, and the sound of Scottish burrs, softened only slightly by the hemisphere, Dunedin is as truly Scottish as Christchurch is English. to Invercargill spend little time at Dunedin Airport before they continue their journey. They know that at all times, with transport and advice, NAC will provide them with travel-free, enjoyable travelling. So much for our passengers. Their tale is told, but behind their story lies another. Back at Harewood and Palmerston North, NAC aircraft go in for major servicing. Here in the great workshops which sprang up during the war years, the passenger and freight planes are given a cleaning and maintenance job which literally makes them as good as new. Engines come out at the end of specified periods to be stripped down to their smallest component, inspected and refitted. <laughs> The upholstery and springs of the aircraft seats are also regularly checked. At all times, the greatest care is maintained by every individual member of the engineering staff to ensure accuracy. Nothing is left to chance. Here, engine parts are undergoing preliminary cleaning before overhaul work begins in earnest. Detailed and careful inspections are carried out by crews of licensed aero technicians. Faulty engine parts, like this one, where the damage is only suspected, are put on an electromagnetizer for final evidence. Then new parts are obtained from the workshop store. The engines are reassembled, tested and double tested until they attain the highest possible effectiveness to the aircraft. The testing of the automatic pilot known affectionately to flying men as George, is only one example of the meticulous and scientific testing that's carried out before the aircraft instrument panel is fully reinstalled and ready for checking in the air. Airborne, and also on the ground, the reassembled aircraft must fulfill a great many stringent tests. A senior engineer accompanies the pilot on all these tests, and a keen eye is kept on the aircraft's performance before it's okay for passenger or freight operation. Daily services between main trunk cities have been increased, and shortly, night passenger services also will be in operation. When there is little time for much needed vacations, long weekend trips to any part of the Dominion are possible with the nationwide coverage of NAC.
today, New Zealand Airways join most points on the same day, and all within 24 hours. For a southern businessman, for instance, a brief holiday in the Bay of Islands, where the big fish play, is enough to stave off fatigue and bring back a zest for living and harder work. The flag means success. Another popular fishing ground is off Tauranga and Mount Monganui, with their long, curving beaches giving swimmers pleasant days in the surf and sun. These are only two of the many beauty spots to which travellers may go in search of a pleasant vacation. The fly fisherman's mecca of Rotorua, one of the world's most famous natural show places, comes next to mine. Under an hour's flying time from Auckland, Rotorua is the best known overseas of all New Zealand's tourist resorts. And month after month, visitors from all over the world arrive here by NAC. Akaroa, just a short motor run from Christchurch Airport. Here, more than a century ago, a group of French men and women set on colonising cheerfully gave up their nationality in the face of earlier British claims to the South Island, and settled down to found the only truly French town in the Dominion. Along a foreshore which still bears memories of whaling fleets and fronts the Anawi Peninsula, Akaroa snuggles in the arms of hills, which protect it from all the winds of heaven and surround the most beautiful harbour in the South Island. Nelson, the sunniest place of all. New Zealanders know it for its tobacco fields, hot granaries, fruit orchards, and some of the finest beaches a traveller could wish for. But it's wings over New Zealand. Let's fly by NAC from Nelson Airport, over the city, and round the top of the South Island. Past rocky cliff faces, and deep, mysteriously beautiful sounds and inlets. another NAC terminal, Lake Maporika, reflects one of the most beautiful sights in all New Zealand. The France Joseph Glacier in its precipitous journey from the high peaks of the Southern Alps. Climbers from all over the globe fly here to Waiho to begin the journeys which will take them to the lofty summits of Mount Tasman and Ailey de Beaumont, and Mount Cook, the Dominion's highest peak, through the passes and over glacier after glacier, testing their skills step by step down to the skiing ground, the ice skating, and the Great Lakes beyond. Wings over New Zealand, the top of this part of the world. If ever anyone needed a reason for flying, this must be it. Viewed from the air, the Southern Alps have a magical language of their own, and the traveller tries in vain to remember the poetry of his school days. Places to go, places to fly, New Zealand is full of them. And NAC is equipped to take anyone, anywhere. Northland, Tauranga, Napier, New Plymouth, Nelson, Picton, Invercargill. Each one has a beauty all its own. Each one is a reason for flying there. Back at the major airport. 
airport's internal flying operations are accelerated by the arrival of overseas airliners from Great Britain, Canada, the United States and Australia. New Zealand is only two days flying from Canada by one of these huge pressurized Douglas DC-6 aircraft. This is real company. It's only a matter of a few moments work for a bed to be made up by this New Zealand air hostess in such a modern aircraft. Air travel has become a real pleasure in one of these airy cabins, these sleepers of the air. Every day, more New Zealanders fly. Baggage labels are tied on, only to be torn off to make room for others with different destinations as travelling by air becomes more of a habit, and the old ways are discarded and forgotten. The big aircraft come and go. Their landings and takeoffs are recorded hour after hour, day after day. They represent a rapidly growing airline, the lifeblood of New Zealand's newest artery of trade. Here, there, and everywhere in the Dominion, and beyond, NAC will take you and bring you back. This has been the story of Wings. N-A-C Wings. A story told proudly of Wings over New Zealand. While daytime aerial sightseeing, weather permitting, was all very well, some passengers needed to fly at night also. In 1951, the National Film Unit was able to make the following report. landing at Parapara, the end of a routine trip by a Douglas airliner carrying passengers or freight on a scheduled night flight on New Zealand's internal airline. Recently installed radio aids have made night flying practical, and the increase in air traffic has made it essential. In a year, nearly eight million pounds of freight and mail, and a quarter of a million passengers are carried by day and night, with a regularity factor of over 98%. Night flying means flying by instruments, and as part of their regular training, all pilots do instrument practice in a linked trainer. Nearly 30 of our pilots are already mileage millionaires, but they all do at least two hours training a month under artificial blind flying conditions. Actual flight conditions are accurately reproduced by the links, and the pilots get practice in flying along radio beams, which they follow by a signal in their headphones. A radio compass helps them fix their position by bearings from radio beacons. The beam system covers most of the main air routes in New Zealand, from three range stations at Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch, and there are over 20 radio beacons from which a pilot can get his bearings. In addition, any broadcast station in the country can be used as a radio beacon. For example, a pilot flying from Christchurch to Wellington, flies along the beam from Harewood. By tuning his radio compass to Kaikoura radio beacon, he gets a bearing from Kaikoura. When the compass shows the correct bearing, it's time to alter course, and by tuning the compass to a Wellington beacon, the pilot can also use it to keep him heading for Wellington. The radio beams and beacons will bring a plane right to the airfield. But if there's a layer of cloud below and the pilot can't see the field, he can find his way down by instruments. A radio beacon tells him when he's directly over the field, and a predetermined radio path clear of all obstacles takes him down through the cloud, and then back again towards the beacon. When he breaks cloud, the airfield is in sight, and he lands in the normal way. The weather is the most important single factor in flying, and all pilots call at the Met Office before making a flight. Then, 
nearly clear skies all the way. What about clear for end this evening? Two to three eighths. Uh, base 4,500 feet, and the wind is south, 10 knots. Sounds like a good trip. Yes. Thank you. When the pilot knows the weather conditions along the route, he makes out a detailed flight plan, which he submits to flying control for approval and the clearance to take off. Plan for flight 106, uh, rides for 6,000 feet. All right, I'll give it to the center. Will you wait for your turn? Thank you. This flight's from Christchurch to Paraparan, and the plans pass to the Christchurch Air Traffic Control Center where it's plotted on an air traffic computer to see there is no risk of collision with aircraft already in the air. To avoid any risk of collision, aircraft on the same route fly on different levels, at least a thousand feet apart. When the flight plan just submitted is plotted, the computer shows the aircraft climbing to 6,000 feet, the height the pilot requested. The computer also shows any other traffic already in the air. And if they would pass dangerously close at any time, the proposed flight plan would be changed to keep them safely apart. In this case, by keeping one aircraft down to 4,000 feet until the other is well passed. The pilot gets a clearance to take off when the flight plan has been checked and, where necessary, amended by air traffic control. Thank you. 4,000 feet, I ask for six. This is a southbound aircraft at 5,000 feet. You can't climb to six until he has passed. Okay, thank you. Calling all passengers for Willington and Auckland on flight 106, would you just board the Douglas airliner, Turk K A O D. Your airliner is under the command of Captain L J. The flight has been planned and checked down to the last detail. But even after takeoff, it will be plotted and checked again through reporting points all along the route. Nothing is left to chance. As soon as the flight starts, it's plotted on the computer in the Christchurch Control Center. Future positions and times worked out, and all information passed to Wellington, who take over control halfway at Kaikoura. Wellington, Christchurch here. Wellington here, go ahead, Christchurch. Hand over, Able Dark. Here to Paragram Airborne at 1632 ETA Kaikoura. 1704, 4,000 feet, cleared to Paraparam Beacon. Expects climb to 6,000 after Kaikoura. Thank you. Hello from Christchurch. 4,000 feet up off the coast of Canterbury, AOD heads north with a full load of freight, mail, and passengers, and all the comfort of a fireside chair. The pilot and co-pilot are constantly checking engine and flight instruments as they fly along the beam from Christchurch. In the pilot's headphones, the beam signal shows they're right on course. The automatic pilot is flying the plane, needing only an occasional adjustment to keep her perfectly on course. There's Kaikoura Peninsula, jutting out from the coast in the setting sun. When the radio compass shows the correct bearing from Kaikoura radio beacon, it's time to call up for a clearance into the Wellington control area and report the aircraft's position to Wellington. Roger, Abbey Dog, 1704, Kaikoura, 4,000 feet, climbing to 6,000 feet, EDA, Wellington South, 1724. Roger. Right the position's plotted, checked with other traffic, and a clearance prepared for the next reporting point. Clear over that dog to descend to 4,000 feet of Wellington South. Roger. Roger Tower, Wellington here. ADC crews up below their dog, immediately after passing Wellington South, descend to 4,000 feet. In darkness now, and at 6,000 feet, AOD nears Wellington South reporting point. The air is calmer at night, and no one need miss their beauty sleep. instruments there's no difference between day and night and the routine of reporting to ground and getting clearances goes on just the same. Below are the lights of Wellington. A city at night is a sight worth seeing and on a clear night the cabin lights are put out 
to give the passengers a better view. On to the radio range station near Paraparan. As the plane flies through the beacon, a telltale light flashes on the instrument panel, and the radio compass swings from pointing ahead to pointing astern. The plane's position is pinpointed without a shadow of doubt, and the co-pilot calls Paraparam Tower for landing instruction. An Estelab at Dark Roger Wellington reporting point at 37, 4,000 feet contact. You're clear to continue your descent click to Fox Roger during the traffic circuit, right hand runway 16. Alternative setting 1022 millibars. Traffic nil. The surface wind is swinging from 130 to 130. Six zero magnetic to six to nine knots. Over. And there below are the runway lights of the airfield. routine flight ends on schedule. From takeoff to touchdown, aircraft are in contact with ground control stations plotting every part of the trip. Radio beams and beacons provide a safe highway and make regular night flying possible, while the efficiency of the pilots and aircraft make it safe and pleasant. Night flying in New Zealand is now an established part of our regular air services. The passengers seen arriving at Paraparaumu still had to make a 50-kilometre journey overland to Wellington. This highlighted one of the major problems facing the growth of air traffic, the lack of good airports, as this newsreel of the time reports. Since the war, New Zealanders have become air-minded. Domestic air services and freight air services fly out of a number of airfields scattered throughout the length and breadth of the country. Most of these services are operated by National Airways Corporation. On a per capita basis, New Zealand's domestic scheduled flights are now the third largest in the world, exceeded only by the United States and Australia. Tarapuram is the main junction airfield in the country, handling upwards of 136,000 passengers annually. This is Harewood, airport for the city of Christchurch, the third busiest domestic airfield in the country. Harewood is today in the centre of a blaze of controversy. Its continuation as an international airfield has been challenged. Today, with the routing of many of the Wellington area's passengers through Harewood, questions are being asked about the economics and the convenience of international services operating from Harewood. Flying north from Harewood, Passengers see the snow-covered ranges of the Kaikoura. Then the coastline of the aggrieved North Island comes into sight. For it is from Wellington, now the flying boat service has ceased, that the loudest demands have come to use Ohakia, ideally situated on the plains near Palmerston North, as an international field. Ohakia, with its two 7,000-foot runways, is, however, an air force station, and jet fighter training and civilian air services do not mix. Air Force has already allowed continued civilian use to be made of another of its airfields, the Nuapai, now the busiest air terminal in New Zealand for international passengers. Almost daily, the big planes fly in across the Pacific from North America and across the Tasman from Australia. The very following day, the decision was made. Ohakia was out.
for civilian international travel. But as has always been the case, the Nuapai is still New Zealand's busiest international terminal. By day and by night, major overseas airlines land, refuel, and take off to all parts of the world. Though for Nuapai's longest runway is only 6,590 feet, and its approach clearances are not as good as, for instance, Harewood, the Nuapai or some other airfield in the Auckland area is likely to remain New Zealand's principal international airport because of the numbers of the travelling public centred near Auckland. For the airlines operating in and out of New Zealand, there is little doubt that a terminal at the northern end of the country reduces the general operating costs. While Harewood has perhaps a good trans-Tasman future, it's difficult to see its future as a trans-Pacific terminal because it entails an extra 300 miles flying. Harewood is now on trial for a year as a trans-Tasman airport. To reach a decision about the number of international airports in New Zealand, it may be necessary to choose between the demands of various sections of the community and the difficult economics of airlines operating out of several different terminals in a country the size of New Zealand. Only small herons could use Wellington's backdoor airport at Rongatai. All other commercial planes landed miles away. Spirits were high again in 1953. Down below, bulldozers were breaking the ground for a new, bigger airport, Wellington Airport. An extension of the runway into Lyle Bay meant finding two million cubic yards of rock for reclamation. An entanglement of 15-ton tetrapods was built into an 850-foot breakwater to protect the scheme from Cook Strait southerlies. A mile north was a residential hill. 160 houses made way for earth movers. Shifting the hill would give a clear northern approach across Wellington Harbour. Down came the hill, four million cubic yards of it. Nearly half was sent northwest by long conveyors into Evans Bay, making an 85-acre reclamation for factories, houses and parks. The other half of the hill was scraped south into Lyle Bay to form the 6,000-foot runway. Since work began in 1952, Wellingtonians had seen practically nothing else but earth moving. By 1958, other work had started. Concrete landing aprons were laid and the final plant mix was sealed. High on a neighbouring hill, the control tower took shape. New Zealand's most modern airport was nearly ready. Labour Weekend 1959, Miss Wellington Airport, Elizabeth MacArthur meets the crowds gathered for the official opening. Two other VIPs attracting a great deal of attention are side by side on the tarmac, the Fokker Friendship and the Dart Herald of Handley Page. RNZAF Devons and Harvards from the training wing at Wigram stick close together despite the bumpy conditions. As the Bay of Plenty Airways Aero Commander leads skywards, Rural Aviation Cessna 310B is parked with the precision of a baby car. Onlookers get a very warm reception from the tail end of an RAAF Canberra. distance world speed records are held by these jet aircraft, 13 of which are going into service with the RNZAF. A Sunderland flying boat, once a familiar sight in Evans Bay, comes in on a very low level run. the Sunderland returned to Hobsonville with a hole in her hull after leaving her mark on the runway. Being considered as a replacement for NAC's Dakotas, the Fokker Friendship turboprop plane shows takeoff and later one motor performance.
rival contender, the Handley Page Dart Herald, of similar appearance and with the same Rolls-Royce motors, takes off and also demonstrates ease of one motor climb and very powerful braking. Sabre and Douglas simulate refueling in flight from a super fortress. This is normally done 20,000 feet up. The supersonic Voodoo and Sabre fly today at 600 miles per hour, only half the Voodoo's maximum speed. US Air Force transport plane designed for turboprop power, the giant Hercules C-130 needs very little runway for takeoff and landings. thousand horsepower of her four motors gives her over 300 miles per hour speeds at altitudes of over 30,000 feet. Ground handling is simplified by the ability to reverse. The RAF de Havilland 4 Jet Comet 2 from 216 Squadron, the world's first military jet transport squadron. The Bristol Britannia, military version of the Whispering Giant. Three sinister looking Vulcan Delta Wing bombers of the RAF thrill the crowd with roller landings. Multiple wheels on the runway, the Vulcan rolls a short distance and then pulls away steeply under full power. landing is to be attempted. Requiring the full length of the runway to pull up, the pilot will touch down on the southern extremity. He's under shot. The port undercarriage has hit the embankment and collapsed. Fuel lines are fractured and kerosene streams behind the Vulcan. With superb skill, the pilot recovers control and lifts the crippled plane safely away from the thronged airport. So that you may see more closely how a disaster was averted, the landing is shown again from ground level. With one leg hanging useless, the Vulcan flies on to Ohakia to make a remarkable crash landing with little further damage and without injury to the crew. Probably the busiest spot during the day, the control tower, guiding all the participating aircraft off the runway and back down onto it with precision timing. Roger, your A black fern Beverly is signaled OK for takeoff. This heavy duty long range transport can carry either 94 fully armed troops, 70 paratroopers ready for dropping, a couple of helicopters, or even a complete hunter fighter plane. 
highlight of the day for most people is the performance of the RNZAF Jetabatic team in their vampires. A great display of precision flying climaxes the pageant, marking the transformation of the old Rongatai airstrip into a modern airport within the city boundaries. Next, it was the turn of Auckland to see its grass strip at Mangere transformed into New Zealand's main international airport, opened in 1966. But first, let's go back to this 1948 pageant. At Mangere Aerodrome, Auckland, a flying display was held recently to commemorate the 8th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. The first air pageant held in Auckland since 1939 it was arranged by the Auckland Aero Club and the Royal New Zealand Air Force in conjunction with the Air Force Association. The programme reads Crazy Flying Demonstration and Crazy Right. The aim here is to chase and burst the balloons which are floating free in the wind. With motors shut off and propellers stopped, these three planes are about to execute dead stick landing. In this difficult manoeuvre, the pilot must land his plane without using engine or propeller. This is a tricky landing, but they do it nicely. This display of skill is a fitting reminder of the debt we owe to the men who fought in the Battle of Britain. January the 29th, 1966, and 98,000 people swarmed to Mangaree for the opening of Auckland's new 10 million pound international airport. 16 years of planning, five years of physical work, and now the big day. Three hundred aircraft worth sixty million pounds are on display, and many are being seen for the first time in New Zealand. One of the strangest visitors puts in an early appearance, driven by a propeller and floating on a cushion of air the curious Westland hovercraft. Already a familiar sight in Auckland skies, a DC-8 leads off. 57 tons of United States Air Force Starlifter. The P-3 Orion, the maritime reconnaissance aircraft that's to replace our Sunderland. Boy, wait for me, fellas. A wing area equivalent to four medium-sized houses, a menacing flying stingray the RAF Falcon. Supersonic Mirages, pride of the Royal Australian Air Force. The question for everybody, will it take off? Long a familiar sight in the Pacific, the stately Sunderland will soon bow out to the long-range Orion. Two more maritime reconnaissance aircraft, an Australian Neptune and an RAF Shackleton. The C-141 Starlifter. This mighty troop carrier can cruise at over 500 miles an hour for 4,000 miles, non-stop with a load of 30 tons. Cruising speed of 525 miles an hour with 80 passengers, the sleek, graceful Comet 4C. An aircraft that could possibly become a familiar sight in New Zealand skies, the controversial BAC-111. Canberra Bombers, the frontline aircraft of the RNZAF. 
These twin-engine jets have done remarkable service in both New Zealand and Malaysia, and are soon to be replaced. A beast with deadly grace. The Vulcan can reach almost the speed of sound. The oldest military aircraft at the pageant, veterans of countless air shows, the RNZAF Harvards from Wigram weave one of the most exciting displays. for jet pilots, but always new for the spectator. A United States Air Force Strata tanker glides over and refuels one Phantom fighter bomber while the other flies escort. Now the two Phantoms turn on a starring performance less than 100 feet above the runway. The lead Phantom idles along at only 130 miles an hour. The second thunders past at over 700. These Phantom F-4Cs can exceed 1,600 miles an hour, twice the speed of sound, and have been mentioned as possible replacements for the RNZAF's Canberras. At over 700 miles an hour, pressure waves begin to form and cause a glowing shimmer around the fuselage. Then it's the silver wasps with the fatal sting, the supersonic mirages of the Royal Australian Air Force. These two have been mentioned as Canberra replacements. Burning fuel at the rate of 50 gallons a minute, rolls are performed at up to 700 miles an hour. craft is at home on land and sea, but aerobatics are beyond its capabilities. How frustrating. Mm. Mm. Last of the crowd pleasers, four vampires from the RNZAS number 75 squadron rolling and looping only 15 feet apart. Binding the world tighter. Now Auckland's new 10 million pound international airport has woven New Zealand into the pattern. Flying is definitely the way to travel. Although the flying boat era in New Zealand ended effectively in 1954, some were used for several more years for sightseeing flights. Let's accompany notable aviator Fred Ladd 
as he flies over Auckland and the Hauraki Gulf in his Grumman Widgeon in the summer of 1965. As well as passengers, freight began being moved by air in ever-increasing quantities after the end of World War II. Up until then, most freight had either been transported around the country by coastal cargo ships or by the railways. Ironically, the railways were themselves one of the first major users of aircraft for freight. Recognising the potential of aircraft as a means of bridging the gap between the North and South Island systems, on the 10th of February 1947, New Zealand Railways inaugurated the three times daily rail air service between Paraparaumu Airport and Woodburn Airport near Blenheim. The nearest railway station to Paraparaumu Airport with adequate airspace as a terminal was in fact Paikakariki, 10 kilometres further down the line, and a disused shed built for the US Marines in World War II was adapted for rail air use. After Rongotai Airport opened in 1959, flight operations were shifted there and the shed at Paikakariki ceased to be used, although it remains standing today. To start the service, DC-3s were acquired from the US Navy. In June 1947, these were taken over by newly formed NAC. In the first year of operations, 5,950 tonnes of freight was carried between the two islands. In July 1947, test flights with a Bristol 170 freighter were being demonstrated, which, with a six-ton capacity, was ideally suited to the task. In February 1951, the rail air contract was awarded to Straits Air Freight Express, usually referred to by its initials SAFE, which proposed to use Bristol freighters with a mechanised loading and unloading system known as the Cargon, seen here in use. Before that happened, a short-term contract was given to an American-owned company, Civil Air Transport Incorporated, which made four Curtis C-46 freighters available to the rail air service for three months, until July 1951, when the first two Safe Air Bristol freighters became operational. Although not the most handsome aircraft, the bulbous-nosed, front-end-loading Bristol freighters gained a reputation for reliability and continued to be used until the end. The quantity of freight carried by the service was temporarily reduced by the introduction of roll-on, roll-off ferries in 1962. But the rail air operation continued until 1982, when the last mention of it was made in that year's Railways Annual Report. Wellington Airport. 
Saturday midnight, and copies of the latest Sunday papers are off to the South Island to be on sale at daybreak. This will be just one of a yearly total of 15,000 flights Safe Air Limited make to 31 airports throughout New Zealand. The company started in a small way 17 years ago to carry freight across Cook Strait under contract to the Railways Department. Since then, the Bristol freighter has gained a reputation for efficient short-haul freight carrying. As well as operating the Royal Air Service, the planes now fly National Airways Corporation freight under contract. Today, the feet of a dozen bulbous-nosed throbbing Bristols is a common sight. Over the years, the company has built equipment for every conceivable freight requirement. When they commenced a weekly air service to the Chatham Islands for the Internal Affairs Department, they realized people would expect to be treated differently from freight for their three and a half hour flight. So a capsule was designed and built to slide in where the cargo normally goes. The soundproofed air-conditioned capsule, which takes up to 20 passengers, can be swallowed by the Bristol minutes after it has unloaded freight. The trusty workhorse is transformed into a comfortable airliner and provides a much needed service to the Chatham Islanders living 500 miles east of the mainland. Containerization has come to passenger transport. To combat a severe problem of soil erosion on the nation's farms in the 1940s, the concept was developed of spreading granulized superphosphate fertilizer from the air, as reported in this following film. carefree days. Planes took off and landed in any paddock they could get fertilizer trucks to. In 1949 they started loading by hand, but these pioneering days soon passed. Machines were developed to load the planes because farmers were crying out to have their farms dusted with superphosphate and lime. The hills and high country were carrying more stock, and grass was growing where it never had before. A new industry was booming. There were plenty of ex-Air Force types busting to have a go. <laughs> Aircraft became more powerful, the loads heavier, work plentiful. New companies started up and down the country but experienced top-dressing pilots were becoming scarce. First, aero clubs offered advanced training for new pilots keen to join the aerial farmers. Then, to meet the growing demand, a special agricultural pilot school got underway at Whanganui in 1963. The government, the company and pupil, each paying a third of the cost of training. Fixing movement about the lateral axis. Our yawing movement about the vertical axis. Rolling movement about the longitudinal axis. Now likewise, we speak To about enter this school, the pilot must hold his commercial flying license. The course covers theory and practical flying. The pupil pilot studies dropping rates for spreading fertilizers and spraying techniques to get a chemical rating. Now the line's in the way and the direction of the wind. Now the first thing in deciding how you get your aircraft, and when it's sowing, the opening is about that much for 100 weight to the acre. For two to three, it's open to about that far, and for jettison, the whole door is open and thus allows the material to go out in a hurry. Well, is there any change when you jettison then? Considerable. When you first drop the load, the nose rises, and then after the load goes out, or as it goes out, the nose drops down again. Come into this position here, 
fall at the harbour and then hover up here at five feet fast walking speed. Then rotate the helicopter 360 degrees. Helicopter pilots are trained by a company next door. Fly sideways to this point. Fall, rotate again 360 degrees and fall on back. Airstrips on hilltops are necessarily restrictive. So, on the flat safety of the airport, one's marked out which approximates the size of those on farms. Bravo Uniform Golf, take off clearance. Over. Bravo Uniform Golf, speed for takeoff. With the hopper full of sand, they practice takeoffs and landings. Get the reaction after jettison. In these trials, a pilot gains confidence in handling a sluggish aircraft and the disconcerting time lag for twisting, turning maneuvers in the rugged backcountry. Bravo Uniform Golf, take off clearance. Over. Bravo Uniform Golf, cleared for takeoff. A great deal of the training is given in steep hill country where 60 degree slopes and thousand foot hill faces are common. New Zealand's generally high and rugged and much of the top dressing is done in this type of country. Some follow the ridges with one to four gradients, while others are dead flat in the valleys. Wherever they land, an overshoot means disaster. Good morning, Mr. Lawrence. It's quite a pleasant morning, isn't it? It is indeed. Lucky to meet Paul Beard, our other pilot. Right. Yes, it's a great day for top yes, dressing. Yes, now, what about your job? I want you to sow this face over here to follow from the road, cut up that face, follow the boundary fence, and up to the gore. Farmers around Wanganui cooperate by providing work for the school, which spreads fertilizer for them at a reduced charge, because the pupil pilot naturally takes longer to do the job. Most top dressing companies like to start their new pilots as loader drivers for a year before they go on to school. The driver and pilot get an appreciation of each other's work and ground turnarounds are faster. Around the back here, and one is caught up with those trees. Wait down there and that'll be one run. When working, the pilots sort out landmarks on the hills around them before they make their spreading runs on the ridges and faces. Loads increase gradually. By the time the 50 hours flying course is completed, the hoppers are full. The early successful attempt in getting fertilizer onto inaccessible rugged country not only increased the carrying capacity of the land, but has also stabilized country threatened with erosion.
there are now 44 companies operating in New Zealand. Their planes fly from over 12,000 farm airstrips, and this year will drop a million tons of fertilizer onto our farmland, as well as seeds, sprays, and weed killers. of New Zealand is hilly and mountainous and before aerial top dressing mainly unproductive. Poor country has become profitable and it's estimated that 12 million sheep and a million beef cattle today graze on grass sown and kept green by Elkhart. With the requisite number of hours behind him, the graduate from the school rejoins his company which has paid part of the cost of his training. agricultural flying industry has given new meaning to Aotearoa, the long white cloud. Although military aircraft had been stationed in New Zealand since the 1920s, the Royal New Zealand Air Force was officially established in 1937, and its first 21 years was summarised in this newsreel from 1958. Wigram has been a flying station since the First World War. In those days it was known as Sockburn and was then a privately owned flying school training pilots for overseas service. That was before New Zealand had an air force. But in 1923 the government established permanent and territorial air forces and with the generous help of Sir Henry Wigram it acquired Sockburn as an air station and named it Wigram. Then in 1937, 21 years ago, the Royal New Zealand Air Force became an independent unit of defence. It is this anniversary which is being celebrated throughout the service this year. Although much of the early development was due to the persistent efforts of such men as Sir Henry Wigram, few could have foreseen how soon New Zealand was to need every training facility at her disposal. The story of the Air Force between 1939 and 1945 is a story of progress under pressure of events. Some 8,000 pilots and 4,000 crewmen were trained by the Air Force during that period. New Zealand fighter pilots contributed much to the demoralising of the Luftwaffe, playing their part from the earliest days of the Battle of Britain. bomber air crews that helped to subdue Germany, there was always a Kiwi somewhere in the thick of it. But it was in the Pacific that the RNZAF operated as a unit with its headquarters in the New Hebrides, the Air Force was able to help in harrying the Japs out of their island strongholds.
the legendary heroes of World Wars I and II are safely harboured in the pages of history and in the hearts of New Zealanders. Theirs was the energy and the confidence that served to telescope into a few memorable years the knowledge and experience of a lifetime. It is to such men that the Air Force this year reserves a place of honour during its 21st anniversary reunions. Let's conclude our look at classic New Zealand aviation with one of the best films of military aircraft stunt flying ever made, Jetabatics from 1964. These men are the aerobatics team of the Royal New Zealand Air Force. In their vampire jets, they paint the sky. Commanding is Flight Lieutenant John Buckmaster, 26. Flying Officer Adam Anderson, 24. Flight Lieutenant Colin Rudd, 27. Flying Officer Trevor Bland, 22, completes the team. All four men have seen active service overseas with the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Before our cameras, these young men will show their prowess in the air. Years of training have given each man confidence in his own skill and the skill of his fellow pilots. Clad in the armour of this age, the team is ready for takeoff. Our cameraman, going up with Flight Lieutenant Barry Gordon, will follow every complex move. And you will join us in the ride of your life. skillful movement, the pilots fly relaxed. Chalk streaked on the sky, the rolling smoke forms and hangs and lives its own short life above the land.
his 50 years of flying, man has traveled far and fast, through the sound barrier, and soon out into space. It is through these men, and their like the world over, that we've achieved our mastery of the air. From the golden age of steam to the modern diesel era, some 80 minutes of archival footage documenting the growth of New Zealand's railway system since 1863 is contained on the New Zealand Railway Story, $39.95 at all good video retailers. From IPL Books comes Antipodean Tales, 23 stories of the supernatural and the dark side by top New Zealand writers, $19.95 at good bookshops or phone toll free 0800 400 301. From IPL Books comes Rutherford's Dreams, a collection of 20 great science fiction stories from top writers, $24.95 at good bookshops or phone toll free 0800 400 301. It soon became common practice to use the air services. At first the odd carton of perishables came in with the passengers, then bigger and heavier cargoes till there seemed no limit to what these small planes could do. From IPL Books comes New Zealand Railway Memories, a collection of more than 230 fabulous images from the golden age of steam in New Zealand. $45 at Good Booksellers. New Zealand Road Memories contains over an hour of great scenes of cars, trucks and buses on New Zealand roads from the 1920s to the 1960s. Recall the days when life was simpler, roads were less congested, and motoring was fun. $29.95 from good video retailers. <laughs> 